Hello. If making money in movies is success in movies, then Robert Zemeckis is currently the most successful director in the world. His films, including the Back to the Future series and Who Framed Roger Rabbit, have earned over a billion dollars at the box office. He's targeted the kids and hit the jackpot, reminding us that Hollywood is still the USA's second biggest manufacturing base. His latest film, Death Becomes Her, opens in Britain next month. It's a black comedy starring Goldie Hawn, Bruce Willis and Meryl Streep. Streep plays a fading actress and we begin with her performing in a musical version of Sweet Bird of Youth. Virgin temptress, dream of lovers. Yes, it's me. Yes, it's me. was it wasn't a very good number but one of the hardest things to do is to do something that is just a little bit bad it would be easy to do it ridiculously bad um, but we wanted Madeline in her character to be singing and dancing her heart out and so we sort of went back and looked at uh, um, a lot of variety shows from the 60s and 70s and kind of put a mix of what we consider some of the worst Broadway and Vegas type steps and things in there, it does reflect uh, Madeline character. Flashy, and that's of course what uh, dazzles Bruce. She's sensational. Uh, we wanted then the uh, choreography to help move the camera back and forth and widen out and things like that, so it kept the frame alive. And the other thing that makes the, the number a bit off, you know, puts it a bit off for the audience is that the other, all the dancers are just dancing their heart out. And uh, some audiences we've shown the film to aren't really sure if this is a bad number or if it's just um, bad cinema. But uh, most of them seem to get it. You know, I think like every other kid um, who grew up in the era of the Beatles, I, you know, had played the guitar and had a band in my garage and basement and that sort of thing. So I had these dreams of being a rock star for a while. And television, I watched a lot of television. And I started fooling around with making movies with, you know, my friends and my relatives and everyone in it. And then, uh, and then that, that just became more and more elaborate and trying to sync up sound with it and then on to uh, doing some things with puppet animation and that sort of thing. And today really shaped up and hurt it. You know, did you ever notice how... I got really interested in films, mainly from enjoying special effects, trying to figure out how they did certain things. Just suddenly... Changes! That was totally uncalled for. He likes to cram a lot of information into the frame. There's always something happening everywhere in his frames. He's got a lot of colors. It's, it's, it's just a lot of energy in each one of his shots, but not to the extent where he's sacrificing telling the story. He likes to tell stories, and he likes movies that work. And that, that, that's a really old-fashioned Hollywood way of looking at material. If you read interviews with Howard Hawks and people, or John Ford, they're really reluctant to tell you how important what they were doing was, but they actually will talk, tell you how they got a shot. And Zemeckis is the same, is, this, is in that, very much in that tradition. I, mean, I personally find it kind of refreshing. The Lift was a film that I did in film school. You had to make a film in black and white with no sync sound, 16 millimeter, no sync sound, and it can only be eight minutes or shorter. And um, th this frustrated a lot of film s students because they, uh, they wanted it to be sing sound, they wanted it to be longer. Um, but I, uh, I loved having those limitations, so I, I made a film, um, designed a story about a guy who is terrorized by this elevator in this gothic apartment building. 
um, and it's uh, just two characters. It's him in the elevator, and every time he tries to get to the elevator, it moves to another floor, and, and finally it, it, it kills him. What I like about the film is that it was uh, pure cinema. And what it taught me more than anything was learning the form that you're working in and trying to, you know, work from the inside of that form out. So writing something that accommodates the form rather than um, doing a half-baked idea. And it's, that's why I'm involved in this TV show, Tales from the Crypt, because that's a chance to do the short film. I really enjoy working in that form. Something needs to be done about that fire. Have you got the poker? Yes. Well, let me have it. What did you say? What are you, deaf? I said, let me have it. Merry Christmas, you son of a bitch. Bob has a real sort of dark side to him. And he loves this kind of macabre, um, kind of story. Honey? Carrie! Tales from the Crypt. I mean, you see this side of Bob that people go, ooh, where'd that come from? Well, that Bob has this curiosity for this, this dark side, for the, the black uh, comedy, black humor side of things. I told you Stan would come, and he didn't even have to come down the chimney. I let him in. got this real fantasy sort of very childlike boyish side to him and he's got this hard side this edge and you put them together you get death becomes her Did you think the fun thing about film is that you you have a chance to um, manipulate time especially in action. In the stairfall and in the strang strangling scene, of course, we wanted it to be a bit almost cartoony in how, you know, she defies gravity by teetering on the edge of these stairs, which does a couple of things. It takes a bit of the reality off of the murder and then allows the audience, I hope, to tolerate this endless stairfall, which was done in a, in a cartoon sense by just by filmically expanding the stairs to about five times their length. In the screenplay, the writer wrote, when she falls on the stairs, she hits every single stair. And that was a wonderful visual description of how the scene had to unfold. And the sound helps us feel every stair that she hits. Oh boy. What a director looks for in a screenplay is uh, things that can trigger images in his head. That, I think, is the key to writing action because you can't really be too specific because it's always going to change but if you can just inspire images in the director in the way that you describe action um, that to me is uh, very good writing. I met Bob Zemeckis at USC Film School in 1971 or 72 71 I think it was. Um, we were undergraduates in a largely graduate department and Therefore, we had a common bond automatically because the department was about 70 or 80 percent graduate students, so all the undergraduates kind of kept together. <clears throat> there were all these graduate students talking about the, uh, the uh, auteur theory and Godard and all this stuff, and we were talking about James Bond and Clint Eastwood movies. So we discovered right away that we had a, a certain affinity towards each other. Well, it, it turned out that we both liked films that had, a, you know, uh, strong narrative um, um, stories and then had action in them. I mean, um, I mean, one of the films we found out that we both loved as, uh, as um, kids was The Great Escape. And we had, like, seen that film, like, uh, you know, we each had it memorized. He was the only person in my life I'd ever met who also owned the soundtrack album from the movie The Great Escape. He wanted to be a director, I wanted to be a writer, and we both wanted to just get out of school and start making movies. None of this 
work your way up stuff. We just wanted to get out there and start doing it. We had a three-pronged attack plan. Uh, one was to um, um, write a feature film because everyone said that's the way to crack into the business and of course that turned out to be true. The, um, the second was to try and do a low budget horror movie which were very popular uh, in those days. And then the third one had to do with Bob hanging around Universal having heard the legend of Steven Spielberg and the legend goes that Steven hung around Universal and found a vacant office and made everybody think that he belonged there and was a director under contract and got a got a directing gig. It's not exactly like that, but it's a good story. And, and I just hung around for the entire episode of a, of a McCloud um, show from beginning to end. And uh, I, I saw them scrambling to write these uh, scripts uh, the weekend before it had to shoot. And so I, I, I suggested to Bob that maybe we could, you know, write some of these. And we did. We wrote a... Um, episode of the Night Stalker. We sold that and they produced that one. Writing was a real good way to get in because they always, everybody needs a script and, a, and paper's cheap. Film is expensive. Well, these two fiends, you know, they, they're all, you know these, these main, uh, just maniacal kids forced their way into my office, you know. I think I was on the Goldwyn lot and they said they were USC graduates. I thought they were imposters. And uh, they, they forced their way up there. But they were so nuts that I had to keep them, you know. I couldn't throw them out because they were just so completely crazed. What's your name? Stanley Dowalski. Polish, eh? What a coincidence. Rudy Polanski, how are you? Hey, I like that watch, Stan. Got great shoes. Love them. Thanks. So, Stan, you, uh, you want to buy this Buick Centurion, huh? Good choice. Smart man, you got good taste. I'll tell you something a lot of people have these days. Nice to see somebody finally walk on this lot who knows a good car when he sees one, I'll tell you. So, we, uh, we read it up? Yeah, well, actually, I was, I was just looking. Oh, hey, terrific. Terrific. That's what we're here for, Stan. Here you can look, browse, peek, touch, feel, taste, smell, do anything you want, take all the time you want. Nobody's going to pressure anybody around here, Stan. Matter of fact, we sort of formed a group, the three of us, and our motto was Civitas Sine Prudentia, which means uh, a citizenry without prudence means basically social irresponsibility. And under the heading of social irresponsibility, that was, we would sit there and talk about, like people today talk about political correctness, we would talk about the, the socially irresponsible merits of a film. Bob and I had cooked up this idea of this, of, uh, that it was a film that eventually became 1941, which was um, about the panic that set in on the home front here in the West Coast right in the days following Pearl Harbor. And then it turned out that John and Stephen over the years had become good friends and Stephen remembered my student film from the early days of USC. And I, you know, gave Stephen the screenplay and he read it and he said, God, I want to make this. So it was like one of those, it, it sounds easy, but it, uh, you know, that was, uh, that is exactly how it happened. We wanted to call it in the, originally, the night the Japs attacked, or it's just plain Japs. And of course that was, you know, politically un incorrect. You can't call people Japs or anything like that, you know. And I think that Stephen might be a bit uncomfortable with that really dark type of humor, and I think he softened it. And I think that's where maybe the material and he were a little bit out of yeah, sync. Yeah, Stephen doesn't have the healthy cynicism that we have. <laughs> <laughs> Just about every frame is filled with some sort of a mayhem of it. fall, explosions, something. something. I think it was Pauline Kale said it was like having your head stuck in a pinball machine for two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that, <laughs> that was a good description of, of what it might have been like. And I'm, I'm very proud. I, I, I put that on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> Bob was over in my apartment one night. And we pulled out the, the first Beatles album. And on the back of it, they had this whole description of all the insanity of Beatlemania. We came to the idea, wouldn't it be neat to do a movie about kids waiting in line to see the Beatles? And that 
little phrase, kids waiting in line to see the Beatles, was actually how we pitched the script to Warner Brothers. And we remembered we'd met uh, two female producers, uh, Alex Rose and Tamara Sayev. We said, well, this is like would be an irresistible package for female producers to have a movie about girls waiting, trying to get in to see the Beatles. And that's who we took it to, and they got the idea instantly. <laughs> It's cardboard. It's one of the most intricate screenplays we ever wrote. And that's when we did a very interesting thing. We do cards, uh, three by five cards. We actually color coded the cards for each character so that when we laid out um, the story in our cards, we could see immediately and graphically how f long we'd been away from a particular character. So sta leaving characters at a point where it promised more story, and then picking them up where you understood where they have been was, well, it was, very, it was a very difficult thing to write when you do an ensemble film like that. The movie was eventually made at Universal, and the, it was the first time in the history of Universal Studios that the legal department said, this is a movie that should not be made because the Beatles are depicted in it, and the Beatles have enough money to sue Universal, and what if they don't like this movie? They could sue us. Don't make this movie. They actually said they have enough money to sue and win. <laughs> <laughs> so we actually, we actually uh, had to storyboard out the Beatles sequences to show to the legal department uh, the scene with uh, Nancy Allen under the bed with the Beatles legs and so forth. We had always described the movie as sort of a cross between American Graffiti and Ben-Hur. Ben Hur in that you never saw Jesus' face, and we were never going to show the Beatles' face. Standing in them, good idea. I remember not really knowing a way to judge uh, pacing. I I would sit there and watch the actors doing the scene, and I would be terrified and distraught that it it wasn't working. You know, it, it, it was flat, it, and, and then. And then I would go to dailies and then be incredibly relieved because something happens when it all gets translated into two dimensions. You know something, though, Stan? I really think you ought to buy this Buick. Mm -hmm. I think you ought to buy it today, right now. You want to know why? Because this Buick is you. The color is you. Look at it. This is your car. Stanley Dawoski is Buick Centurion Convertible. Now, I know what you're thinking, Stan. You're thinking... I got uh, more confident before when I went and did used cars, more confident with the camera, more confident with my ability to edit, more confident in being able to deal with the actors. In this deal, well, the rest he's alone of owning a Buick Centurion convertible can't even measure in terms of dollars and cents, am I right? The thing you never get comfortable with are all the external pressures that, you know, the studio exerts in different strange ways. With I Want to Hold Your Hand and Used Cars, we had absolutely sensational sneak previews and we had these guys who were experts from the studio telling us oh these movies are going to be gigantic these are these are so great they're uh, these these are going to do so well and they didn't and you know you learn the lesson that uh, that nobody knows what they're talking about nobody knows what they're doing uh, you know we were 26 27 years old and we made I want to hold your hand and we thought gee that guy's the head of advertising uh, he must know what he's doing and he didn't he didn't have a clue. And we would deliver the film, and then everyone in marketing and advertising would look at us and say, so what do you want us to do? And we said, oh, so we have to do the advertising, too, and we have to do the marketing. Oh, well, I, we, we didn't know. The movie comes out in three weeks. We'll work real hard now. So, <laughs> so that's, what we, that's what we learned, is that, you, unfortunately, um, uh, you, can't, you, you can't just be a filmmaker. Even the most powerful filmmaker is desperately afraid of having a financial failure because the business is ruled by bean counters, you know, and by boring bean counters at that, you know, who are arrogant, young punks, you know, and there ought to be an enormous bloodletting, a night of the long knives in which everyone with a suit is hanged. After we had done used cars, Bob and I wrote Back to the Future, and um, uh, a studio executive um, was given the script and it, it made the assumption that this was going to be a package with Steven and responded extremely favorable to the screenplay. And, and then Bob and I came in and he had a meeting and we said, now here's what we, we're going to do. And we're talking about the screenplay we're going to do. And he's nodding enthusiastically. And, 
and then and then uh, halfway through the meeting, he said, "And so now, um, so now, what's Stephen's involvement going to be?" And we, Bob and I, said, um, "Well, he's not involved." And the guy went, "Oh." Mm. And the meeting was over, and that was the end of uh, the end of uh, Back to the Future at that studio. People in Hollywood, including people like Steven Spielberg, grasp that this guy's a real talent. But in Hollywood, the, the conflict always comes down to this. You can know somebody's really good, but if they keep making movies that people don't like, you then find it really hard to back them. I think the interesting, the interesting case here might be to compare Zemeckis to someone like the, the Coen brothers, who also make movies that everyone can tell are really well made, but somehow don't connect to the audience. The interesting leap that Zemeckis made was to actually go from making movies that, that critics and other filmmakers could admire to making movies that connect with the mass audience, which is just about the hardest thing there is to do. It was for three years that I, I didn't direct, and then I was finally offered Romancing the Stone by, from, from Michael Douglas. And the screenplay was, uh, was uh, pretty pretty crippled in, the, in its early stage, but I, I immediately knew what, I, what had to be done to, to, to kind of fix it. You got any valuables in that suitcase? No. Yes, all my clothes and things. Uh, you got an umbrella? No. You got a good pair of walking shoes? They're all like these. Uh -huh. It had wonderful characters, and it had, you know, and, and the story was there. Okay, let's make some time. But the ending didn't crystallize. Treasure films are, I think, very hard films to do because um, what's, what starts the movie is uh, greed, and that can't be rewarded at the end. So typically a treasure film has to end like Treasure of Sierra Madre. It has to sort of be tragic in a sense, and the, and, and, and the treasure has to go back to nature or be blown in the wind or something. Uh, and so the dilemma was, is, was it's never satisfying for the characters to go on this trek and actually end up with the treasure. So I guess my main contribution to the screenplay was the, was the sort of um, twist ending where, where you felt it ended like a typical treasure movie where the alligator got the stone. Thank you. And then in the bittersweet sense, Michael Douglas kisses the girl goodbye. And then the, the 80s ending was that uh, after all these, all these months, he actually hunted down the alligator and got the, uh, got the treasure back and they all lived happily ever after. It changed the perception of Bob Zemeckis as a director. It said, here's a guy, here's a director who can direct movies that don't have anything to do with Steven Spielberg's involvement. Uh, he can direct actors, uh, he can tell a good story, and he can make money. Uh, and now every studio in town was ready for Bob Zemeckis to make a movie for them. Uh, and the movie that he most wanted to make, of course, was Back to the Future. And we took it back to the one guy who had always believed in it, Steven Spielberg. The studio executives that passed on it said that they liked the script, uh, that they just didn't think that sweetness was something that was box office or time travel was box office. So it wasn't that this script is terrible, it was this script is good but it's not commercial. The thing I'm the most proud of Back to the Future is the, uh, is the screenplay. Um, that is, that is, that's my favorite screenplay that Bob and I wrote and it, and I, I feel it's the most intricate and most interesting, and and it, it, you know it reminds me of a you know of a great old Billy Wilder type screenplay where everything is there, every single frame of film, every line of dialogue is is uh, advancing plot or character, and that's what I always loved, and that's what I had always hoped to do. It happened upon my father's high school yearbook. And I was thumbing through it. My father went to the same high school that I did, and he was the president of his graduating class. And I looked at this picture of this guy wearing this tie, and he was my father, and he looked like one of these political jerks that I went to school with. And I wondered to myself, gee, I wonder if I'd have gone to high school with my father, would I have been friends with him, or would I have had nothing to do with him? When I came back out to L.A., I told the story to Bob, and Bob said, yeah, and wouldn't it be neat if you found out that your mother, who said she never did anything, she was in cars and parking and all this stuff. What I 
was your age, I never chased a boy or called a boy or sat in a parked car with a boy. We just got going on this idea of, of meeting your parents uh, as, as a teenager and, and interrelating with them. Yeah, horrible nightmare. Dreamed that I went back in time. It was terrible. Well, safe and sound now, back in good old 1955. 1955? You're my mom. You're my mom. My name is Lorraine. Lorraine Bates? Yeah. But you're, uh, you're so, uh, you're so thin. When all of these things are set up at the beginning, you're going, well, why are they telling me this story about this family that's kind of dysfunctional and they aren't getting along? And why am I seeing this stuff that is kind of in uninteresting? And then suddenly, after an hour, things are starting to be paid off one by one by one, and the jokes get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what's exciting when the audience can put together, oh, that's why it is. That's why they showed me this, and I'm figuring it out. I've never seen purple underwear before, Calvin. Calvin, why, why do you keep calling me Calvin? Well, that is your name, isn't it? Calvin Klein? It's written all over your underwear. Ah. The kid has to go back in time in a time machine. Where is this time machine going to come from? We don't want it to be the Department of Defense's time machine, because that opens up a whole bunch of stuff that we don't want to deal with. Uh, we don't want it to be a dream. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not a wish. It's not a genie that does it. It's got to be a time machine. And who would invent a time machine? And American folklore is full of the idea of the crackpot inventor in his garage. And it's Doc Brown. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Doc. Uh, are you telling me that you built a time machine? Out of a DeLorean? The way I see it, if you're going to build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? Besides, the stainless steel construction made the flux dispersal. Look out! He's out there. He's crazy. He's nuts. He's wild. And so, by virtue of what it is that this character has to do to serve the story, the characterization came out of that. Uh, the same thing is true to, to a large extent with Marty McFly. How do you take like a, a hip teen kid from the 80s and have him have a relationship with this, this character? And that was, we struggled with that until we came up with the idea of the, of the, of the amplifier, which actually, in that image of of this giant loud amplifier it's the one element that made it very easy in one f in one image to understand why the two characters were together marty appreciated and the doc the, and, the, and doc yeah. appreciated doc saw value in having an amplifier <laughs> that could do this <laughs> and for whatever reason we don't know but at least but at least we understood then the connection in the sort of and the and the and the and the friendship between the two Because as the film starts to go from the script to the physical stage, then all, things start to layer on, and then we'll find a, a prop or an idea will come out of the art department, and we'll the, use that in, and, and make the, that a part of their character. In the first Back to the Future, when, uh, when the uh, costume designer showed Bob the guys in the gas station dressed in their perfect suits, he said, I just got a great idea for a gag. And he thought of the gag to uh, have the four guys come out and service the car and contrast it with, uh, with the You Serve Yourself gas station of today. See, I think that a movie like Back to the Future is, is a very, very uh, character-driven film. I think the effects are, are quite, the original Back to the Future, are really minimal. They're supporting the story. They're not what the movie's about at all. And what's wonderful is the ideas in Back to the Future. We couldn't get a speck of publicity on this film uh, to save our life. Everyone just considered it to be some silly teen high school movie. And I, when, when we tried to explain the, the, the story in a, in a press blurb or something, it sounded like a movie that you didn't want to go see. And, and, and it was considered a film in trouble, and it was going to get killed in the summer against the... Explorers. sequels that were coming out, yeah, and these other high-profile films, and it just 
literally burst on the scene. First time that we screened the movie, which is in Long Beach, California, and at the end when the car turns around and rockets off and Huey Lewis comes on at the end, well, the audience went up to the ceiling. I mean, it, they... I've never seen a preview like that. And at that moment, we knew this is a huge movie because that kind of response I'd only seen once before, and that was in E.T. That was a... But in another way where everybody was crying at the end of the movie. But in this case, they, they came out of their seats at the end of the movie. And only then did we know that we had a, a, a big hit on our hands. Mark. Action. The future. Here we had the perfect opportunity to do something that could be that could never be done under any other circumstance, where you have a sequel, so you you can be risky with it to a certain extent because uh, it's a sequel. So. The only point of doing a sequel is to, is to try something different. And yet we had a sequel about time travel and time paradox. Um, so the logical thing was, so, so let's do something that we will actually go back into the first film and see things from a completely different perspective. And that's illustrated the best in the film when Marty goes back and witnesses the moment that his father punched Biff at the high school and he's there duplicated and he's watching it from a whole different perspective and all the the most complicated Back to the Future time paradox themes are like wrapped up in that section of the film. Talk about deja vu. I think Back to the Future 2 may be the most successful formalist film ever made. The whole joke of it and all the wit of it is actually watching the juxtaposition of basically a sequel over the film that preceded it, which is actually a very self-referential kind of filmmaking. And, that, and really, if, you know, if someone like you know, Godard or, or, or some, some European heavy had done it, everyone would have thought, how brilliant. But this, this was actually done in a, basically in a mass, mass market Hollywood film. The studio didn't really give us give us a hard time and we weren't showing the early drafts of the studio anyway that was one of the advantages of of, of uh, writing a sequel to one of the most successful movies of all time when anybody ever asked a question uh, we could arrogantly say are you going to tell us that you know more about making a back to the future movie than we do and they <laughs> say no no you guys know what you're doing with back to the future so so there was a level of pressure that that wasn't there in the development process. Well, that's why we were always tied to the trilogy because we knew in our hearts that the, th the third installment was going to be the one where we were liberated. But we needed an entire movie to get rid of the clutter and, and get us back into the track in the same tone and vein as the first one. Well, I always felt it was the only way we would ever get a chance now to do in the a world to do a western because the genre seems to not have much life in it, if any life at all. And uh, yeah, yeah, and it was great. It'd be fun to do this. I mean, we just said, well, let's go back. Let's go back to the very beginning of Hill Valley. Hill Valley is a character in the stories, just as the human characters are. So let's see the beginning of the clock tower. Let's see all this kind of stuff, and it just gives you. It just gave us a chance to go wild with these, uh, right. with these great Western archetypes. What's your name, dude? Uh, Mart Eastwood. Clint Eastwood. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of stupid name is that? Our perception of the West is only through Western movies because there was nothing to record it, actually. So uh, there's, I think there's a part of every film director, I really believe this, uh, who who wishes he could do a Western. Um, um, and, I, and I think it's, it's interesting to watch because a lot of films that filmmakers make are actually Westerns. Um, you know, Star Wars is a Western, in my opinion. Um, it just takes place in space.
Shit. I try very hard not to react to what I had just done when I choose another project. I don't see the point in that because uh, um, you then shut the door on what might be a wonderful, really wonderful movie just because it had a special effect in it. And so you said, I'm not going to do that or I'm not going to do a comedy. The thing that attracted me to Roger Rabbit initially was the very first scene in the very first screenplay. And I felt that when I read the first, I guess it was five pages, because the first two sort of just described the cartoon, and then when the cartoon character stepped out, it just, for me, was just a brilliant idea and suspending the disbelief of being able to create a world where you could mix animation and live action. It was just crystallized in that uh, first scene. This is Roger. He keeps blowing his mind. I felt that the movie could go anywhere from there. And the idea of mixing these genres of film noir and, and uh, animation was just so outrageous that I, I felt that it had to be done. I'm crying out loud, Roger. How the hell many times do we have to do this damn scene? No! I'll be in my trailer. Take a nap. Excuse me, Toots. We were faced with so many technical difficulties on Roger that he would have to create on the moment a maybe a new scene to deal with something that we couldn't do physically uh, because it couldn't be animated or there wasn't a way to do it with a, f a special effect or some physical effect. And he would have to design the scene to go in another way uh, in order to make it work. And his story-making sense and his ability to write dialogue helped him be flexible in that way and, you know, uh, sometimes created even better scenes, I think. We had this shot where this stork is riding, a Eddie Valiant's coming down, this stork rides a bicycle through the shot. The bicycle is real, the stork is going to be animated. And the bicycle, we could never get it to go through the shot and stay upright. It always fell over out of shot and there was no way, because it was a pan round, to, to not see this fallen bike on the ground. In the end, Bob, of course, said, all right, well, what we do is we see the stork go through the shot, we hear this crash, and when we pan around, there's the stork all over the ground with letters flying everywhere, and that's what you see in the movie. It was not scripted. It's just because we could not get the bike to go through the shot and stay upright. Two things were um, that happened after I came on board in the screenplay that made, it, made the movie um, arc, I think, to a different place was... Uh, Jeff and Peter came up with the idea of J Judge Doom. Everyone knows you can't kill a cartoon character. So the invention of this diabolical um, uh, character, Judge Doom, and, and this dip that would erase cartoon characters was able to finally let us create a story that had a, uh, uh, a dramatic structure because there was real jeopardy, hence conflict, and all the other stuff that falls into place. <laughs> That's right, my dear! Enough to nip two town off the face of the earth! Vehicle of my own design. 5,000 gallons of heated dip pumped at enormous velocity through a pressurized water cannon. Two town will be erased in a matter of minutes. That was the first uh, breakthrough idea, and the second was, was another outrageous idea of... Uh, of uh, the reason the judge was doing all this was to create the, uh, the uh, Los Angeles freeway system. And that just fit in perfectly. I, I love that idea. Soon, where Toontown once stood will be a string of gas stations, inexpensive motels, restaurants that serve rapidly prepared food, tire salons, automobile dealerships, and wonderful, wonderful billboards reaching as far as the eye can see. My God, it'll be beautiful. There was a lot of suffering in making Roger, and that was because it was, every single shot was so technical from every aspect. And uh, the hardest part of doing any special effect, and what I consider my job to be, is to, um, is to keep reminding the cast that they're not props and that, you know, and, and, to, and to keep them from getting 
bogged down and, and, um, and uh, crushed by this giant technical uh, sort of space that they have to, have to perform in. I never, in a weird way, thought of Roger Rabbit as an effects movie, which is an insane thing to say. But I got so used to just the cartoons being in the scenes that I thought it was just a story about this rabbit and this guy. And then, you know, he knows these guys and they know these guys and this is what happens. And although it was a phenomenal effects picture, and it's the same with, um, with Death Becomes Her. Uh, Death Becomes Her is, is a movie with a lot of new and, and really never seen before special effects. I will not speak to you till you put your head on straight. But at the same time, I don't consider it an effects movie. Universal bought the script. <clears throat> we did a couple of drafts with them, and they said, we'd, we'd like to make this. And uh, Bob has obviously worked with them a lot in the past, and they said, would you like to direct it? And he said, sure. A pretty uncomplicated story. Um, yeah, that was a great, I was I was in, in the set of another movie. I was shooting another movie, and, and David called me and said, "Guess what? Bob Zemeckis is interested in, in in doing a picture. Who was a quirky little comedy?" And I thought, "Bob, I mean, Back to the Future, uh, Roger Rabbit, Bob Zemeckis. Are you sure? Did you get it right?" And we had a meeting with him the 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 following week. It changed my life eh? and my perceptions, and I understand how. Come, I come from Europe. I lived in Europe all my life. How, how wrong the misperception we have of the, the studio system of Hollywood of people, how the people work here. It seems that films with special effects and sort of elaborate style tend to always be about some kid who's got to go on an adventure or like an Indiana Jones type, type of film, which are great. But this one had those elements and it had this incredibly dark theme. I thought, what a wonderful idea to try and blend these elements. Now, I'm, I you know, don't know if it's going to work or not, but that was the, that was the, uh, the thing that in inspired me about the film. Basically, it's about two women who've known each other for a very long time and have been jealous of each other for a very long time and will, and will do almost anything uh, to, to make the other one look bad. Uh, it's, what it's really about is vanity and, and pride and, and, and the obsession with one's appearance that seems particularly prevalent here in Los Angeles. But the thing that drives it is the feud between these two women. long but she's alive what we really wanted to do here is is actually have her head put on backwards and I mean we were able to pull that off using computer graphics the thing about this illusion is Meryl's ability to do this where she first had to do the scene with a hood over her head acting from the neck down and then about six weeks later do all the acting from the uh, neck up. What about the time of death? Do you think they could ever use it to prove the phone call came after? No, no, it's very difficult to determine time of death within a few hours. It's not really an exact science. Ernest. It's not an exact... Ernest. Ernest! You pushed me down the stairs. This is Meryl Streep. And at this point, what she has is a slight problem. Thing, and, I, and, and I'm very proud of that because I really learned something, which is that, that uh, when you have got writing that is so good and you've got actors that are so good, that to impose editing by just the virtue of how you would set up a scene, like say if you set it up to be over the shoulders, you would have to edit to do the scene and so then you're imposing an element that doesn't necessarily have to be there. So I wanted to design shots that would be that wouldn't have to be edited if they didn't need to be. So in this scene here with Madeline going into Chagall's, it's a, it's a Rodeo Drive salon that on the top level looks very normal and sort of Beverly Hills gaudy. And then, and then the idea was that you go downstairs and we just keep putting on levels of strangeness. Uh, I mean, she walks with a guard. Then there's this guy getting his blood tr trans, you know, blood transfusion in this in this terrible bed that goes around. 
and we want to just keep layering strangeness onto it. And then this is um, this is something I thought of when I read the script again the very first time. I wanted to do. I did this in one shot that's 360 degrees and you see the entire room in this shot. They're obviously um, in the room uh, by themselves, but then uh, you'll see toward the end of the scene on the same sofa where we picked up Madeline, Chagall just mysteriously appears. Makeup myself. Makeup is pointless. It does nothing anymore. Are you listening to me? Do you even care? You just stand there with your 22-year-old skin and your tits like rocks and laugh at this is something that might be too hard for the in the first viewing for the audience to grasp because the scene is is so loud and 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 there's so much in the, and the room is cluttered with this equipment and stuff so you might believe that there might be another door there so that was part of my idea of, of trying to make this a very strange and mysterious you know what place I mean? how about that money is no object it means nothing to me <coughs> oh, oh, mr chagall i'm sorry mr chagall i'm really really sorry Anna, don't just go away. A great idea for a movie is still the rarest commodity. So anybody can write their way into the film business. What I like to do in films is make them dense and complicated, and hopefully not so dense and so complicated, so that they can work on a broad level, but then if someone has got a love and an, and an ability to see sort of film subtlety, then they, there's something in them that they can, something for them that they can enjoy as well.